first uh, thing we should start. Okay, so Ronnie, over to you. Thank you very much. It's a delight to come and spend some time with you and just share with you some of the stuff that we've been doing at Exeter. Uh, and really just, uh, I'm very excited that you've begun your journey. And I hope that some of the stuff that I share with you today will be inspiring and make you enthusiastic about it. Um, so today I'm going to go through, uh, my name is Ronnie Roberts. I'm the head of teaching quality assurance and enhancement at the University of Exeter. I'll share with you some of what that means in a, in a little more detail in a, in a short while. So today I'm gonna to go through with you a bit about us, what, who are the University of Exeter, who we are, where we are, and what we look like. I'll tell you about teaching quality assurance and enhancement, and uh, I'll share with you why I think partnership is important, and some of the benefits that we've seen from our own ex experiences. I'll give you a framework of example, an example framework of, of uh, student engagement and student partnerships. And then I'll share with you some of the activities that we run at the University of Exeter uh, that are around student partnerships and student engagement. And then we'll have some time for questions, more or less in that order. So if you put your questions in the chat box, then we'll address those at the end. Now, on to us. This is the University of Exeter. It's our main Streatham campus, and we're very, very lucky in that we are, our Streatham campus is, the whole campus is recognised as a botanical gardens. So we've got lots of, um, lots and lots of lovely trees and wildlife and uh, green space to, to walk around in, although we haven't been allowed on campus since the 20th of March, so by the time we get back, it might look more like the Amazon jungle. Um, the University of Exeter is a world-class research university and we have excellent student satisfaction, which we pride ourselves on. We're a member of the Russell Group, the leading research intensive universities. And we've been a, we've been a, a university, a major leading university for, for quite some years now. We have around 25,500 students from around 130 different countries and our success is built on the partnership with our students and a very clear high focus on performance. So this is another one of our campuses, also in Exeter, this is St. Luke's and this is very near the hospital and is where our um, Faculty of Medicine or College of Medicine and Health, uh, the, dis the Discipline of Sports and Health uh, Science and also our Graduate School of Education is based. And then we have another beautiful campus in Penryn at the beautiful seaside town of Falmouth. Falmouth is, um, as you can see, right on the coast. Uh, so this is 100 acres of beautiful campus, which has a very, very strong research uh, focus. And we have some leading research teams in there, extremely strong uh, in reputation, including the Environment and Sustainability Institute, the Science and Engineering Resource Support, Res Sorry, I, I got muted. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, um, so apologies for that. So, and the, the European Center for Environmental and Human Health, as well as a very strong presence in marine biology. So our uh, Pen Ring campus is really all around sustainability and uh, 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 environment as a focus. Um, for some reason I can't. Move on, let's try again. Okay, so a bit about teaching quality assurance and enhancement. We have the academic development team and they support our staff who are involved in teaching to achieve, to develop and to excel. And the purpose of this team is to support colleagues in developing and implementing good educational practices and enhancing the student learning experience. Then we move on to the technology enhanced learning team. Their aim is to promote and develop the use of e-learning across the university to enhance the student experience. We strive to ensure that our teaching, our, our e-learning facilities are those that would be expected from a world-class teaching, learning and research-based university. The technology enhanced learning team are also uh, involved in evaluating new technologies and looking at how they can be implemented to support our online curriculum and exploring and providing advice that 
embed new technologies and new ways of teaching and learning across our colleges. The quality and standards team, they provide support for academic and professional services staff and students across the university, as well as our external partners. In order to safeguard our academic standards and enhance the quality of our teaching and learning. So they are faced a lot with compliance and that's where their focus is. This is also the place incidentally where uh, the team which are the student partnerships and community team sit but I'll get on to those a bit more later. The academic skills team is dedicated to helping students to enhance their academic success and to get the most out of their educational experience. They support students to become confident, capable, independent learners through provision of academic skills and support. And that is done with a partnership, with an inclusive uh, approach. So they work around tailored, le tailored lectures and they have bespoke workshops. It's also where the peer support program sits. Again, I'll share more of that with you in a, in a while. Um, and then we've got the program development team. The program development team I think this name tells you what they do. They work on the basis of new programs and improving existing programs. So they identify where the market is looking for uh, program opportunities, and then they work with our colleges to develop those high quality programs that can identify the need that the market is telling us it exists. Ronnie, That's I was wondering if you want to hit the slideshow button because you're, you're, you didn't do it. Just in case, if you want to get the full screen, yeah. Sorry. That's fine. Okay. We were, we were seeing it perfectly, but now, yeah, thanks. Okay, a bit of apologies. No, that's um, fine. So then we, uh, the program development team, they, they, they're, they're majorly focused on looking at how we can improve uh, the quality of our programs, but also improve growth. Uh, and that's growth in our students, both internationally and domestic. And then the education incubator. So the Exeter Education Incubator is an investment from the University of Exeter in cultivating pedagogic and innovation and collaboration. So the incubator supports academics from across the university by creating spaces in which they can explore and develop pedagogical innovations and ideas. It enables at universe, any University of Exeter academic to apply for a proposal, to submit a proposal for funding and to participate in networks of interested peers, providing access to expertise and examples of inspirational education practice across the board. Partnership is, is a core commitment at the University of Exeter and the, uni the, edu the Education Incubator champions support effective and appreciative partnerships. So very much our students are involved in those proposals that are taking place with the, or those projects that are taking place with the Education Incubator. Okay, so then we, um, this is how some of our structure, it looks quite busy, it's very simple really. It's a hub and spoke model. So in the center here, you can see that this is professional services and some of them are listed around there. And we have six colleges that sit around the edges. We work with our colleges in a very close and consultative partnership arrangement. So we provide the services that the colleges and our academic services, our academic colleagues need. Each of the colleges has institutes and although those institutes may look static, they're actually very collaborative. So they work across colleges and disciplines uh, and they're research institutes. So their, their primary focus is uh, generating research that can inform, um, well, whichever area they're working on informing, but also about reputation building. Uh, we're in very fortunate position in that we have two student unions. We're very unique in that respect and the Student Guild is our Exeter based campuses and the Student Union is our uh, Penryn based, our Cornwall based campuses. And we tend to involve those in almost every aspect of our university governance and decision making processes. So that's just a little bit about our structure um, and how that works in reality. So let's talk about partnership and why partnership is important. So tell me and I forget is allegedly attributed to Benjamin Franklin. Tell me I forget, teach me I remember, involve me and I learn. However, there's contention that says in fact Benjamin Franklin didn't say this 300 years ago. It was more like a Chinese philosopher 
called Zhuang Quang, who lived around 312 to 230 BC, so more like 2,300 years ago. And he said, not hearing something is as good as hearing it, but hearing something is not as good as seeing it. Seeing something is not as good as knowing it, and knowing it is not as good as putting it into practice. So whichever is true, I think it remains current today as it was either 300 or 2,300 years ago. People learn better when they're involved in their learning, and that's what partnership is really all about. So next I'm going to share with you a bit of an example of a model, and this, this model comes from the advanced higher education in the UK, so I can't claim glory for it, I can only help you to understand it. So, and essentially what you'll see around the yellow circle here is that there are nine values that this model says need to exist in partnership for it to be realized and effective. And then there are four, four areas of partnership in here that most of these things seem to fit into and they're concentric circles so they're overlapping as you can see for yourself. Those values, authenticity, well, all parties need to have a meaningful reason for being part of a partnership. And they need to be honest about what they can contribute and the parameters of the partnership that they're setting up. And this is, again, I think, as, as you're starting out, these are questions you should be asking yourselves. What does this mean for us? Inclusivity. Partnership embraces the different talents, perspectives, and experiences that all parties bring. And there are no barriers, structural or cultural, that should prevent potential partners from getting involved. The reciprocity. So this is really around ensuring that all parties have an interest in and can benefit from the partnership. It's not a partnership if only one part of that partnership benefits and everyone else loses out. That is not a partnership. And we'll talk more about what partnership, a, def a definition of partnership is in a little while. Empowerment. Empowerment is about how that power is distributed appropriately and all parties should be encouraged within the partnership to constructively challenge the ways of working and learning that exist or have existed or that you want to exist. Um, because of course, but through challenging, through constructive dialogue, learning is actually taking place. And also, those, those challenges can seek to show and reinforce existing inequalities. So trust, trust is incredibly important. And all parties need to take the time to get to know each other, metaphorically speaking. And they engage in open and honest dialogue. They need to be confident that they will be treated with respect and with fairness. Challenge, all the parties are encouraged to constructively challenge practices, to look at structures and look at approaches that undermine the partnership intention and ask the question why are we doing this is it possible that we can do this another way is there a better way for us to do this they should be enabled to take risk and develop new ways of learning without penalty community all parties that join in a partnership generally tend to feel a sense of community and the sense of belonging and these this belonging is valued fully for the unique contribution that each partner makes to the partnership. And responsibility. All parties need to share a collective responsibility for the aims and individual responsibility for their own contributions to that partnership. So it's not, you know, everybody needs to take their part and, and carry their bit of weight. Otherwise the partnership is not really a partnership. Understanding. And applying these values is critical in supporting the formation of and development of partnerships. That is essentially what this is all about. Later on, I'll share with you some of the activities that we have that sit within these areas of these four uh, partnership areas and explain to you how they work briefly within the time that we have. I guess it's up to you to decide how you want to shape your approach to partnership. 
and it has to be within your context because your context is different to my context. Your learning is different to my learnings. Your starting place is different to my starting place. So you need to understand your context and what is in your con within your context what it is. The other thing I would say here as just a piece of advice: don't try and boil the ocean. You can't eat an elephant all at once. You need to do it in small chunks. So, like many other organisations around the UK, we at Exeter have developed activities that fit into these four um, areas of partnership. So learning, teaching and assessment, curriculum design and pedagogical consultancy, scholarship of teaching and learning, and subject-based research and inquiry. And I'll talk more about those in a little bit. For the moment, what does partnership mean to you? So here are a few definitions that I've taken of partnership. Partnership is a relationship in which everyone involved are actively engaged in activities by engaging in the activities through a process of collaboration and participation they will benefit. Part of their approach or a means, partly their approach or a means of achieving things is not the overall goal. So partnership is not your goal, partnership is the vehicle to achieve your goal. A collaborative and reciprocal process through which all participants have the opportunity to participate equally, although not necessarily in the same way, through curricula or pedagogical concepts and decision making, implementation, investigation or analysis. And then finally, student-staff partnerships mean treating students as more than customers. That's treating students as other learners, other educators, other contributors. What, what all of these things have in common here is that they recognise the partnership is the vehicle and not the end goal. And developing the process of partnership, you should also recognise that working in a partnership is an experience which can be very hard and may take both staff and students way out of their comfort zone. If, especially if they're used to operating within a certain paradigm, that paradigm shift can be very uncomfortable. And it may require that staff hand over quite a lot of control and potentially power to students and that students accept this control and power and share the responsibility for the outcomes. So we're moving away from this idea of a, of a sage on a stage that the educator stands and tells everybody what they know. It is a process of learning collectively. And the other thing I would say is accepting this shift requires courage. And it also requires very careful management and support on behalf of the university. So you may want, in terms of what does it mean to you, my advice would be, you may want to start looking for examples within your own university of good practice, because it is likely that when you start to look actively, you'll find examples where partnership is actually happening in teaching and learning, and it's alive and well. And I would say, start with that look at how that's happening and then build on it because those people who are doing that are going to become your champions then i would suggest you look for examples outside of your university that resonate and adapt them if you need to to suit your own context it's unlikely that you'll find something that out of a box will be 100 percent right for you in fact i would say it's unlikely highly unlikely. So then we move on to some of the benefits from the partnership and these are some of the benefits that we've seen from our own partnerships. Um, why is partnership important to students? And these are some of the benefits. So we've got a huge amount of information, studies show that partnership in education is important and effective, very effective not only in improving administrative functions within the university, though through, you know, that's very important, but in the teaching and learning. So we look at self-determination, and what we've seen is that students who are engaged in partnership or involved in their teaching and learning 
develop self-determination. Students get to feel that they have some contribution to shaping their own learning through recognition and participation. Identity. Partnerships help to develop a sense of belonging and a sense of identity. And that's very important when it comes to building community. Engagement. Overwhelming evidence shows how partnership improves and increases student engagement in teaching and learning. And increased engagement makes the job of teaching a lot easier. Resource. Partnership becomes a resource for developing essential skills that will be incredibly important for employability and further study past where the learners are right now. And also responsibility. They get to develop, students get to develop a sense of responsibility for making their education successful. So they have a part to play in their own student experience. And satisfaction. Overall, Partnership helps to improve levels of satisfaction within the student experience and within the teaching at the university. When partnership is working well, all of these other factors come together to provide a sense of satisfaction. So those are some of the benefits that we've seen from our own examples and um, when we've done it well. So what about the institution? So there are some fundamental benefits for the institution too. For example, Again, we see satisfaction. A university that can demonstrate student satisfaction has a very strong message, especially when it comes to looking for staff to recruit and looking for students to attract in the future. Which leads me on to retention. It is indisputable fact that it is more cost effective for universities to retain their students than it is to recruit them. So if you can hold on to your students and retain them through partnership and engagement, why wouldn't you? Reputation, a growing a reputation for satisfaction, involvement and partnership leads to improvement in the rankings, which leads to improvement in funding, which leads to improvement in the next, in, in, in reputation. And then also community. So looking at community is a further benefit of the development of a sense of student and staff, which brings value for everybody. And resource, again, I talk about resource because learning from and with students, including the development of their own capabilities, is an important dimension to the academic continuing professional development process. As academics, we should all be looking to continue to continuously develop and understanding how students learn is a fundamental part that continuous professional development as an educator. And your students are your biggest asset, truly, they are, and they can be an excellent resource. Again, I'll give you a few examples of how they're resourceful for the University of Exeter. And really good ideas are generated through dialogue that benefit everyone and can contribute to enhanced research and papers. And students very often inspire academics in many areas, especially in technology these days, and technology-led innovation. And then we've got the institutional learning, and the university as a whole grows as a total part of its sum, because as everybody else engages in this and grows, so the university evolves as an organization. And you can develop case studies that have shown transforming in th transformation in thinking and practice of teaching linked to a reconceptualization of learning and teaching as a collaborative process. Again, that's not, that's not mine, that's, that's the um, empirical evidence that essentially is out there. Um, okay, so then we talk about the partnership activities that we've got going on at the University of Exeter. And I've just listed some of those things. And the reason I've chosen these is because they fit within the four partnership areas of the model, the advanced HE partnership model that I shared with you earlier on. I mean, there are many more examples, but these are some that I thought would be interesting for, for our conversation today. So as I've mentioned previously, we, we're fortunate and, and unique in that we have two student unions. We involve those student unions in almost every aspect of our governance. In fact, it's written into our policy our university policy that we have, um, student representation and student involvement. 
An example of that is through the academic representation framework, which is supported by our student staff liaison committee and is written into our teaching quality assurance manual. And I've provided a few of these links to some of this stuff at the end of this um, uh, presentation. And also I've sent through to Manuel to share around afterwards. So I've chosen the, the example of student staff liaison committee because it fits into the curriculum design and pedagogical consultancy area of the partnership that we saw. Because the aims and the objectives of this is to enable students and staff to jointly to participate in the composition, the management, and the review of the college delivery of programs for education. The, the importance of this is it's intended to be with a view to improving the quality of teaching and learning. So it's a mechanism for students to feedback the things that they think work and the things that they think don't work. And also to facilitate a greater communication between the students and the staff within the discipline which can be to identify areas of concern, but also to provide areas uh, where they see in good practice. And that good practice can then be disseminated and shared out. So, I mean, our colleges, just, just to, to illustrate that, um, you know, how we've embedded this within our, our sort of governance, our colleges are expected on, on an annual basis, well, three times a year, to provide us with documentary evidence how those students have been participating in the quality assurance and in the development of the programs that are being run. So students as change agents is the next one. And I've chosen this example because it fits into the scholarship of teaching and learning partnership area. And students as change agents is an initiative that was started at the University of Exeter about, about 10 years ago. And has since then spread across the higher education sector within the UK, but it's also influenced development in other countries. And the main objectives of this program is for students to take a leading role in running projects which are intending to, intended to improve the learning experience for both themselves and for their peers. And to do this, we provide them with some um, some funding, small funding, but also support from an advisor that can help them to structure their, their project, but also stay on target and stay on budget. And it's been hugely successful. And we, we have every year, um, we have many new projects that are coming up and uh, working with them. We've also got students as partners, which is a very similar thing. But in the students as change agents, where it's the student, who can do it on their own or as a group are leading. In the students as partners, they're working in partnership with an academic. And so anyone, include, you know, a student or an academic, can come along and suggest that they want to start up a, a student as uh, partners or student as change agent project. Essentially, the students identify an academic, they talk to that academic, they present them with their idea and ask them if they would like to partner. And then they come back and we work with them on, on setting up that partnership. And they benefit from the experience of the academic working through that process. Uh, so I just, earlier on, I just said to you, I would share with you some of the information around the peer support scheme too. And the peer support scheme I've chosen because it fits into the learning and teaching assessment partnership area. And essentially what it does is an active learning approach. It supports students and gives them the opportunity to gain support and guidance in a very relaxed and informal environment from students who are at a higher year or level than they are. So it, it, the peer meant the, the students have been in the same position and it might be that they're studying the same program or it might be that they've been in a, a similar circumstance and the support that they can get from their peer mentors is either with to do with their academic study or it can be around struggles they're doing with finding with transitioning through university life the students in the higher years the peer mentors as we call them receive a training program and that training is about how to be a mentor and how to engage with your, your mentees um, and to provide that kind of support that needs to be provided. And the process allows both the mentors and the mentees to enhance their studies because very often both of them are taking back 
learning and gain and applying it at the level of study that they're working at. They enrich their own educational experiences and they can develop a wide range of skills, which is also very useful for progression, but also very useful for, for life after university. And the peer support programme takes place across the university. As I said, both staff and students can set up a program. And each year, just to give you a sense, we, we have around about 3,000 <coughs> students who are getting support from about 400 mentors. So it's, it's a very successful and um, popular program. And it seems to pay dividends because we get very positive feedback from it. And then the Education Incubator Project. I told you a little about the Education Incubator previously. And the reason I've chosen these is because it fits into the project subject-based research and inquiry uh, element of the framework that we saw before. And the pr research projects here are led by academic, but funded by the university. And students can either apply or be invited to join these projects. And the projects are based around a set of key priority areas, which are set by the education leadership team. And one of the priority areas each year is research informed learning. And this is a way that we continue to feed uh, research in, uh, inform information back into our teaching programs so that our, our, our teaching programs remain current. Um, that's one of the mechanisms, mechanisms that we use for that process. The, the next two, which are student campus partners and the digital learning developers, these are a, a little bit different and I'm not, I'm not really aware of many other universities that have a similar sort of thing to these. So I'll, I'll just explain to you how they work in, in, in sort of partnership um, and why, why it works as a partnership. So as student campus partners, this is a role that we've created at the University of Exeter in order for us to satisfy a mutually beneficial arrangement. And that is that sometimes the university needs access to short term quick resource for um, employment for small projects. And this student campus partner role allows students to be employed by the university for a maximum of 15 hours a week during term time and for a maximum of 100 hours in total. So the objective being to get our students involved in the university, but also for them to gain employment, important employment skills the roles, as I said, are mostly suited to supporting things like short-term projects and focus groups. But the principle around this is that we need, the, we need the resource and students need the jobs. So again, it satisfies both of those uh, needs. That's a similar thing. And the Student Campus Partners is aimed at our existing students. So these are students who are currently studying with us. The next ones, the digital learning developers, are also known as graduate business partners. This is aimed at recent graduate leavers. And this is principally the same thing. We've created these roles where our recent graduates are allowed to be employed for a maximum of 23 months in anything. One of the ways we're using them at the moment, we start the presentation, which is where the University of Exeter is moving its entire teaching uh, program portfolio to flexible delivery. So it will be online, blended and on campus. And we have employed a number of our uh, recent graduates as digital learning developers. What they're doing is they're engaged in supporting our academics to build online content for programs. And the aim of the role is to develop employment skills for them, support academics with this massive task, and co-create learning content. So they've been working very closely with our academics on that content and, and putting it into our virtual learning environment. The arrangement gives our graduates the first-hand valuable experience of working and developing skill sets that are critical for the employment in the future employment market. And it also gives our graduates a bit of a head start. And after the recent pandemic, they're probably going to need it. Um, 
So, here's some testimonials that uh, these are around our, these are from the, the Students uh, to Change Asian projects. So Peter here says, taking part in, oh, sorry, taking part in students as change agents scheme has given me valuable experience in project management. The support that I received from the university has helped me to bring my idea to life and paved the way for other students to build on my work. And well, you can read Julia's comments um, for there. The next couple of slides I'll show you are real comments taken from our feedback from our national student survey. And the first ones are positive comments and the second one, not so positive comments. But I thought, you know, for a balance, it's probably just as well that I share some of those with you. So these are some of the comments that we receive from our students. I've loved my time at the university. Students feel valued and their opinion leads to change. That's from a business management student. Opportunities to give feedback, like the course, was constantly improving. Lots of placements, including early placements. That was from a colleague in medicine. Supportive environment with a real community feel. No point throughout the course that was particularly stressful. I feel well prepared to become a doctor. I'm glad they feel well prepared and aren't very nervous about it. Not the kind of quality in a doctor you want. The lecturers go out of their way to help and make you feel included in the department. That's within our humanities. Always felt like a community of staff and students who generally wanted to listen to our opinions. That's from our College of Life and Environmental Sciences. So you can see that, you know, the, the reception from many of our students, uh, and these are just the ones that I chose uh, quickly when I was pulling this presentation together. Now, here are a few maybe less positive comments. Lack of response to feedback we've given as students, very unclear marking criteria in some modules. I've felt throughout the course that we are treated as children. We are adult learners and very responsible ones at that. We should be able to dictate what is useful and beneficial for us. I don't think the university hears the voices of marginalized students, those struggling with finance and mental health or racial discrimination anywhere near enough. So, you know, these are quite hard to hear, especially when you try and very, very hard to be as inclusive and partnership based as you can. What though I see from some of this stuff is our students feel that they're able to tell these and that their expectations are reasonable, that they are saying, for example, we absolutely want to be able to say what's useful and beneficial for us and then we want you to teach us about it. So that they realise that these partnerships exist and they, they, they're, they're basically telling us you're not doing enough. And so what we try to do, I think, what this tells us as well is that we, it's indicative that we're never 100% where we would like to be and there's always room for improvement. The important thing, I think, is that we hear and act appropriately and that the comments that are shared, these comments are actually shared with the academics responsible for the module, that, uh, the course that was fed back about them. And then we go with my department, with the colleges, we work with those academics so that they can take the feedback within the within the means it was meant, but also that they can acknowledge and respond appropriately. And where training will be helpful, that training is then given to them to help them to respond to that. What we do ask our academics is to acknowledge and respond, to, to share with their students year on year, what are the improvements you're making as a result of the feedback process. Um, and then we're back on this. I've mentioned B previously, whether this is 300 or 2,300 years old, the message is still as relevant today as it was when it was said. I've included a few links at the end of this presentation for you. And as I said, I've shared them with, uh, with Manuel, who can share them around. They links to our students as change agents and also to our student staff liaison committee. And before we move on, uh, it just remains for me to say thank you very, very much for your, uh, inviting me to speak to you today. I hope 
that by sharing some of our experiences and some of our learning that it's, it's given you some something to think about and then um, and, and that you know you, you start to investigate your own context and what works for you and so I guess now it's on to questions. Thank you Ronnie for the inspiring talk. I'll Maybe we can start with some of the questions that were posed in the, the chat. For example, one from Joao Matias who's asking if this uh, relationship between teachers and students are comparable to this modern, modern relationships between companies and clients. Could you comment on this, please? Good question. Um, yes, I think I would say that in Indeed, it is comparable in some respects because essentially our students are our customers and universities are a business. Whether we agree or not, that's the reality of the, the point is we cannot survive without funding. We need to generate our income. And so that effectively makes us a business. And I would say a business that doesn't listen to its customers or doesn't involve its customers in its strategy setting or in its service delivery finds it's not a very successful business and doesn't last for very long. So this would be a very good comparison in the way we do things at uh, our universities and the, the way we listen to the students and involve them in the different activities. Absolutely. And yeah. I would actually go further and say that, you know, what we do as well is we involve our employers yeah, yeah. as sure. much as we can. Yeah. yeah. Sure. So it creates, you know, that partnership it doesn't only have to be a two person partnership. It is also a partnership of more yeah, sure, parties. Sure. So it's um, the whole community that should be involved and not just um, students and, and professors, of course. The other question is about uh, student satisfaction. You mentioned this at some point. There is a problem here, sorry. Um, and the question is whether this is somehow embedded in teacher's evaluation and correspondingly in their salary. Do you consider this at your university? Is this relevant Sorry, at all? Sorry, Sandra, can you repeat, could you repeat the question? Yeah, sure. So, so the question is whether the level of satisfaction of students, as you mentioned, as, as a, an important uh, assessment, whether this is accounted for teachers' evaluation and salaries and progression in the career so at your in, university. In terms of in terms of progression, yes. In terms of salary, no. Okay. Um, but certainly, it is one of the considerations that the um, the the promotion board considers mm -hmm. when an academic ap uh, applies for a promotion. There is an element of um, part of the application process is to demonstrate how you have engaged in uh, innovation in education right. and and demonstrated impact. One of the things you could do is to use your feedback as a, a means of evidence for that process. Yeah, okay. I would ask Anna Balula to uh, ask her question and um, uh, to you directly. Would that be okay, Anna? Yes, of course. Okay, uh, my question regards um, uh, students uh, as partners. And I, I really wanted to know how you put it, this into practice. So how does the, start, the process start? What kind of outputs are expected? How do academics react to the students' proposals? How do they evaluate which ones are they willing to take or not? If you could give us some insight as to how yeah. we do it. Of course. Um, so the, the, the program is, is, is uh, essentially there are uh, templates that we've set up, which we give to, to the students and the students can download on their own accord. There is nothing that is out of question. So a student can say, I would like to investigate how we can perhaps, I'm, I'm just thinking of an, a random example, how we might improve the communication between the lecturer and the students. And one of the things that, that you know, this might be a, a something that is, uh, is, is certainly important for the, the academic who has received feedback that perhaps they don't communicate very well. So, so it might be that they are thinking, well, I 
really, this is an opportunity for me to hear from how my students perceive me and participate in that. There is no obligation for an academic to participate in that program. But in the same way, um, Anna, the academic can also have a question and go to students to ask me, would you like to participate in a project with me? So it's definitely a, a two-way and an open, um, open program. Anybody, anywhere can do it. Is this, is this within the curriculum or outside the curriculum? It is outside well, of the curriculum, but what we have is a, something called a, a higher education achievement report, which is an additional report that students can then add to show that they've engaged and achieved outside of their academic capability. Like a recognition of what they've been achieving throughout. Yeah, absolutely, the absolutely. Yeah. And it can count towards that yeah. um, certificate. Manuel. Yeah, sure. I don't know, Ronnie, if you want to keep on with the dog asking us questions. Or... Oh, so I didn't realize the dog was still there. Sorry, <laughs> you've all come up in front of me. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, and somebody was asking as well, if you could give a clear example, a really straightforward example of, of a project, you know, that you think it was a really good project to take. I think the person who was asking the question, was it students as partners or students as JJ? So if you give an example of any of those. Uh, a concrete example. Um, okay, so some, uh, a concrete example was a group of students within our business school who uh, got together to essentially set up with, uh, uh, as students as partners, and formulated a um, student partnership board. So they, 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 this was essentially uh, to provide student input and uh, opinion towards how modules fit within programs and where they feel certain modules could be improved. And so they now sit as, as effectively what is a reference group for the, the university. Now that student who started that is no longer at the university, but that practice is still in place. Thank you. Is that concrete enough? Uh, uh, if the participant who asked the question thinks uh, he or she, I'm looking for yeah, the question yeah. in the chat, I can find it. Is that a, is that a good example? Yes, I, I think so. Okay, yeah, there, was a, there was a question here from, from Facebook, a colleague of us who was sitting in Brazil, but again, I'm trying to find, his name was Marcus. Uh, Gabriel, can you, can you help and, and, and feed the question to us, please? Hello, Ronnie. Uh, Marcus Hello. from Brazil uh, talked to me in Facebook that uh, we have some difficult about the future uh, in the students' culture to, to plan uh, the vision institutionally. And so how is your work in your university to give this culture for all university in main uh, action? Uh, can I compliment the question? Please. Just add in a little bit. So the, the, uh, he, we are always concerned about it, does the great things that we hear from abroad fit within our culture? Okay, like, right. Okay that's going on. And so I would complement it in, in a different way, which is when you started this whole process that you were chatting with me, it was about 10 years ago, was it something that was really inside out? So was it the university for some reason that decided to start this, all these great initiatives? Or was there an external environment that was helping you in going in that direction? I think it was a bit of both. It was um, that Within the, U, within the UK, we are uh, a fairly well-regulated uh, sector. So we have um, a, a regulator, which is called the Office for Students, and we have a national quality assurance agency. And part of um, the role of the national quality assurance agency is to develop something called a quality assurance code. And that code was uh, beginning to demonstrate that students pay for their education. Therefore, they should be considered and involved in generating the education, the delivery. And that, that was part of the drive, although not the entire driver. Um, from, from Exeter's perspective, and not all universities in the UK are the same, but from Exeter's un, uh, perspective, we're a very collegiate, uh, we have a very collegiate approach and a very sort of collaborative approach with our student body. So that was also one of the drivers, and it was it was because 
we recognise working with our student body and is much simpler and much more beneficial than trying to do it some other way. So I'm dying to ask this question and I'm going to do it. So you've been all around the world, including... Right? What, Sorry, ma'am, while you broke up there, could you... You've been all around the world um, yep. doing this sort of work, including countries like China, which have a very different uh, system and a very different way of thinking about things. Did you see this work there? Did you see examples of this partnership set? Mm, I, I, can, I can't honestly say... Um, so I think I think I would say not in the same way, but I would have to say that, you know there are significant cultural differences okay. that exist, um, and I think that the, the Chinese universities would say in within their cultural context that they do have examples um, of where this can work. But as far as I'm aware, from a uh, a systemic point of view or from a, 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 a regulated point of view there isn't a real requirement in China to demonstrate this kind of um, way of working. Thank you Ronnie. Patricia she has a question. Patricia would you, would you like to join in please? Hi Ronnie, uh, thank you for your excellent presentation. It was really nice to hear from you and your examples. And my question was, uh, I was wondering if you could develop a little bit more on the difficulties felt by professors in implementing these partnerships. Because I feel like you, you have given us some feedback and some feedback examples that uh, students provided you. And I would like to understand a little bit more on the potential difficulties that professors felt throughout the whole processes. Thank you. Um, I'd be happy to, Patricia, and thanks very much for that question. Um, the I would say that um, some professors feel very differently than others, and some are um, uh, some find change a little easier than others, and some are more able to be challenged than others. I think for professors who are not used to being questioned or challenged, uh, this kind of way of working, or, or what I should say, is the support for this kind of way of working may, may need maybe a little higher than for some others. Um, though my experience personally is that most professors, once they understand that, that, the, that, that it, isn't, it isn't a threat, and it isn't a, um, that it does have benefits, not necessarily just for themselves, but the benefits it can deliver for the students are more than happy to engage. I'll, I'll, thank you, Ronnie. I would give the floor to Luisa, uh, and then we would uh, finish, if you agree. Sure. Luis? You there? So the question from uh, Louise is about uh, the um, talking what students think is yeah, it's the yeah. best for them. Oh, you're there. Ah, there's Louise. <laughs> there you are. My... Oh, they're working. Okay. Thank, so, you. Thank you so much. Well, my question is about um, what you said about taking into account what students think it's best for them based on the feedback from a student. Um, and no doubt that's really, really important, but to what extent should we take that into account? Because, you know, sometimes what we perceive as being best for ourselves is not. When we indulge in that last slice of cake, we probably shouldn't. And students sometimes feel the same way or react the same way. Yes, yes. Well, um, and, and the, the piece of cake analogy is very appropriate through lockdown. Um, and, you know, my fridge is beginning to scream every time I open the door. Uh, but certainly you're right. Uh, and there may be perfectly valid reasons that a student is saying that potentially, you know, they may, there may be disagreement between um, the delivery of a program and the desire 
from a student. But Luigi, I would say to you that that requires dialogue. That, you know, generally, once, once people understand why something is impossible, it, it, they're usually satisfied that there's a relevant response for that. Where, where I think the problem occurs is when the, the, the student or the requester is just met with no, don't like it, don't want it, then I think there's a problem. But if there is a sound pedagogical reason or potentially even a, a technology reason or even a, a, some other sort of um, structural reason, generally that is accepted as, a, as an authentic response. Thank you so much. So, Sandra. I, th I think we should finish because we need to go to um, docencia Mai's activities. Besides this one, this is a, a highly relevant one, but I know that some of the, the attendees here are not part of uh, docencia Mai's and we need to uh, move ahead. So thank you very much, Ronnie, for your um, talk, for the excellent discussion. Thank you. Uh, and uh, we will look at the comments you made available. We'll, we'll have them available to, to our participants. And I hope we'll keep in touch and I hope to see you in the next EUA meeting again. Indeed. <laughs> if if uh, we're ever allowed to travel yeah. again. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you're always welcome to come to Portugal, Aveiro, Minho. They're not, we're not that far away from each other, so. Um, well, thank you very much. Thank you. You've which was the original plan was to have yeah, it absolutely as as you know so we'll 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 keep the ticket well not the, the, exactly the ticket but mm -hmm. the flight, so to bring you over and you've been really inspiring and uh, deep uh, in the um, um, diversity of areas that you've provided ideas and uh, worked on actually more than ideas of all showing all the things that you have done so we thank you a lot for that um, you, I think you left us a clear message. We have to really think it over on our side because model, a model is a model and we have to adapt. But now we have many uh, good ideas and we know where better where to look at and we'll talk <laughs> and we'll call it for advice. Okay. okay. Well, well, nice thank to you see you guys. More. Thank, thank you. you. Bye bye. See ya. Bye. For the rest luck. of the stuff. Yeah. And, and keep safe. And yeah. yeah you too. Yeah. Okay. See ya. Bye. See you. Bye. Bye, Bye, Bye Ronnie. Thank you. Bye.